Welcome. This is the SAS portion of making magnificently good graphs. If you've just come here from the introduction or from R, you kind of already know how we're going to do this. But if not, welcome anyways. This is part three of our special topics talk. Number three, I'm Dr. Mark Williamson. So if you've done the R portion, you kind of know how this works, but we'll go through it anyways. We'll be looking at making great graphs in SAS, starting by creating basic graphs and then seeing how we can upgrade them by modifying various elements. The five elements I've broken them into are labels in yellow, axes in green, colors and shapes in blue, dots, lines, and text in purple, and a catch-all other in gray. And I will be color coding the upgraded code as we go through like I did in R. Now, if you haven't already taken the pretest, now would be a great time to follow this link and do that. There's also going to be links available in the description below. You can get the SAS code and follow along that I have here, as well as the SAS data set. Because what I actually did was I took the data that I used in R, created a combined data set, and then cleaned it up and worked on it in SAS so you can access the data we're using here. I wanted to have both the R, SAS, and to the best of my extent, SPSS all use the same data. That's why there's a specific data set here. And then finally, if you want the slides to go along with this video presentation, you get the PDF here. And again, stay tuned for a neat little treat that should help you out in SAS at the end. And if you've already done the R portion, you know that I am good for it. So you can be assured that the treat awaits you. Alrighty, let's get set up. I will be using SAS Studio. If you have access to the full SAS version, of course you can use that. Everything should work in there. But if you don't, SAS Studio is a good alternative. You can get set up below with this link. Here's a little bit of what it looks like. Uh, it runs through your browser. And so some big pros on SAS Studio, especially for students or others who don't have access to proprietary SAS software. It's free. That's uh, a big plus. It has great support, just like every other SAS program. And you can sign in from every computer. Some of the cons are is not all SAS functionality is available in Studio, so it's a little bit limited, though not for our purposes. Uh, there are some upload limits. There's a certain size to how big you can load data sets. And then unsaved work loss, so if you have an internet connection issue or so forth, you can lose your data. So save early, save often. Let's jump right in then. We'll be starting with histograms, now unlike in our R portion of the talks, where I had three examples, we'll just have two because we don't have the ggplot, non-ggplot dichotomy. So with a simple histogram, we'll start with code here. We'll be using this proc or procedure sgplot for pretty much all our graphing, and then we'll use other procedures for other sorts of data wrangling, manipulation, etc. So all we need to do is tell it the data set and then for histogram, histogram, and then our continuous variable. So here we have Nile River flow rate. To do a two-way histogram, we can upgrade it a little bit. Same proc SG plot. Now our histogram on height. In these statements, the required text Go here, and then if you want to include optional text, you can have this slash and then add that additional text as needed. So we're going to group ours by our category, gender, and then we're going to add a transparency so the bars are somewhat transparent. This is analogous to the, the alpha in R. So there we go. Not too bad for only a couple lines of code.
Okay, now we'll move on to box plots. Simple box plots really take very little work, thankfully. Set the data and then we'll use this V box. So vertical box, you could do horizontal, but I prefer vertical, but um, it's gonna be pretty much the same code for horizontal. So our continuous variable, our numerical variable, and then our and then we have the slash, and now we're going to use category to whatever our categorical variable is. So there we go. Pretty simple. Two way box plot. Not much different. The only thing we're going to add is since there's two ways, we're going to have a category, which is going to be on the x axis, like our feet is here. And then our group variable is going to be colored. And that is our cultivar. And here we go here. So not too bad at all. Let's look at upgrading them here. Now we're going to start to get into a little more work here if we want to really customize our plots. So I'm going to start and show you this, uh, what I would call kind of a stat hack here, is creating what's called an attribute map. Um, so you use the data step instead of a proc step. Data step, we're going to create this thing we call chick weights attribute map. It can be anything you want, name it. I normally call it whatever the data set I'm using and then attribute map. And there's uh, three things it needs. It needs length, input, and then data lines. So the length uh, just really needs the size of things. I'm not gonna go into too much about this. Mostly um, you can kind of look more at syntax and, and information. I have references up on this. So you need to tell the length of all your variables and then your input is the different variable. So here we have ID, value, and fill color, and then our data lines. And so the lines are going to be, each line is going to have our ID. So check ID, our value. In this instance, is this is going to be the different uh, categories of feed, and then our fill color, the thing we're actually going to eventually change. So I have different colors here. And so now what we can do with that is when we run proc sgplot, we can throw that in. So to include an attribute map up on this first line here, because like every every line in SGPlot kind of ends with this uh, semicolon. After data, we have data attribute map, and then just call whatever you called this. Um, and this is all going to be pretty normal. And then we have a, a, a variety of things here. I'm going to just show it right now so you can see what, where we're going in. Variety of things, but then the big thing with the attribute map is somewhere you have to have the attribute, attribute ID and then whatever that ID you, you linked it to. So now what it does is it says, okay, for each of these different feed categories, it's going to give a, the specific color you set up. And so you can see now here is that we have a nice setup with colors for each of our different types of feed. And then everything else here in this blue are these different, um, other than box width, which has the size of these boxes, how, how wide they are. The, all these other ones are those attributes. So whisker attributes, line attributes, medium, mean, outliers attributes. It, and I'm changing all the colors to black because I think the default was a sort of off blue to get nice and colored. So we can see here, so whisker attributes, so that's that. Line attributes, I believe it's like the, the actual box itself. Medium and mean, these two things here, the line and the dot. And then outlier attributes are these outliers here. So we can change every one of those individually as we want. And then finally, I just re-labeled re, um, the y-axis as weight. So there we go. So what are these horse beans here that apparently are the, the worst for, for chicken? Well, it, apparently this is what they look like. Yeah, so turns out that not very good for chicks, which should be obvious because when I think horse plus beans equals not, not good for chicks. Feed chicks like chickpeas or, or I guess sunflower. So anyways. Let's take a look-see at our two-way box plot upgraded. So again, we're gonna use our added attribute map, our length, different length. Now we have more um, 
more things we're going to do with. We still have our ID, still have our value. Those are required, but then we have fill color, line color, marker color, marker symbol, marker size. You can see you can customize all sorts of things. And so our data line is a little smaller because we only have our value is going to be those cultivars. And we're going to have a couple of the colors and then come up some more attributes of our circles. So let's uh, pop this up here just so you can see where we're eventually going. Now, before we get going on, we are, we're going to do another little little thing here. Is it's it's really hard in SAS to like while you're in here is to rename these actual labels like it is. It's a little easier in R. So what I typically do is I what I do is I do this data cabbage set cabbage step. So it's essentially is updating our cabbage data set. And I'm going to create actually another variable uh, with this if else statement. This is a pretty simple way to um, create an alternative variable that has the correct sort of um, text that you want for those labels. So each time there's a D16, I'm going to create this date two that is day 16. Say both day 20 and day 20, uh, day 21. So then when I call this, again, have that root mat. Now, instead of date as my category, I'm gonna have date two as my category. So we'll use these, these nicer titles. Attribute ID, uh, this is another nice thing because a lot of times with box plots, you want the median, that's what the line is. So I can have that no mean, so it doesn't have that little uh, circle there. In addition, I'm to what I did here with this attribute ID, which uh, changes the color and all sorts of things. I am going to add a dot plot on top of it to so see the spread of data. So I can use a scatter. So again, um, just kind of like an R and GG plot, these proc SG plot, it's sort of layering as it goes. So you start with VBox, it's on the bottom, and then you can put a scatter plot on top as they go down and so forth. And so a scatter plot, we're gonna do the pretty much the exact same thing. We're gonna have Y, X, and then we're gonna group by cultivar. But then uh, we're gonna group display by cluster. So it uh, clusters out rather than stacking. And then I can do things like uh, have cluster width, um, have a little narrower. And then again, I have this attribute ID because I had a couple attributes for the dots that I had in the attribute map across cultivars. So you can see here, um, actually, I think it's these ones too. So you can see I colored the dots to match the colors of the bars, as well as making them filled circles and then making them a little, I think, bigger or smaller, depending on whether the default was uh, with this six. And then I changed the axes labels like we've seen before. Okay, so I will let you off on a little exploration here. Uh, you can find this prompt also in the SAS code. So try creating a two-way box plot of cabbage head weight. So head weight, we've already seen that here. Across, or not here, we've seen uh, sort of acid content. I now want you to use head weight across the same things we see here, cultivar and date. See if you can uh, get that to work. All right, now we are on to bar plots. Now, if you follow along with R, you knew that this is when things got Things got dicey and serious. Now, I, I'm not gonna deny that it's a little more work than some of the simpler plots, but it's actually quite a bit more intuitive or at least streamlined in SAS. So because bar plots deal with calculated variables, means, standard uh, deviation or confidence intervals, it's usually the result of a statistical test. So that's what we'll be doing here. So we'll start with PROC GLIMIX. So this is how you run generalized linear mixed models. Of course, I could do t-tests or ANOVA or all these different things, and there's specific programs for that. But generalized linear mixed models can do everything just as well. 
So I just like to use that for everything. In fact, if you really want to, you can check out my one of my other special topics talks, generalized little mixed models for everything that shows you how to do just that. But I digress. We'll be using proc limits to calculate the values we need. So uh, like hgplot, you need to tell it as datas, and this is how things are set out. Anything that's a categorical variable needs to be in this class statement. And then this is our model statement. Think of this as y equals x. So our y variable and our x variable is species. Then we need our least squared means. That's the values that we care about to use on our SG plot. So by species, that's our X variable. And then an optional thing we want is confidence numbers, CL. We'll output this into a new data set that we're going to call iris means. So now we can use iris means in our proc SG plot. And this is what we'll use. Now we're using V bar parm. So that's uh, V bar plot with parameters. So these means and confidence intervals. Obviously you can do horizontal as well, but mean uh, vertical, I think looks better. So the, there needs to be a category. So that's our species. I'll, I'll, um, and make sure you're not using this V bar parameter without using parameters, using a means data set. If you try to use it with other just raw data, it's not going to work very well. Category and then response is estimate. That's what this output calls our, our means. Uh, you can always print out this data set to confirm what, what it's actually called. And then we want an optional lower and upper limit, and that gives us this data set here. We got three different species, our means, and then our confidence intervals. To a box plot, I'm going to go through this a little quicker now, is pretty similar. It'll eventually give us this, but we have a proc limits. Now, since it was two-way, we're going to need to have uh, two different categorical variables. Our model is going to be the interaction between wool and tension. So that interaction is this asterisk. Our else means needs to have both of them. Get our means. And again, category response. But then since we have a, another categorical variable, we can have an optional group by tension. And this is an important bit. Again, we want a group today display by cluster. If you don't, it defaults to having them stacked up on top of each other, which usually isn't very interpretable. And then against our lower and upper limits. And there we go for that. Now, again, I'm using proc limits. You could use all sorts of decision charts to figure out what your data needs for what sort of tests and what statistical test, and then run that with a specific limit statement, but no, you don't need to do that. Just burn that all, kill it all with fire. Use proc limits. You can use that for ANOVA, t-test, regression, the whole lot. That is going to make your life a lot easier. All right, um, enough of my pontificating. Let's get on to upgrading our plots. Again, we can make a data map, attribute map. All I'm doing here is a fill color for now. Now there's another step here that I want to do is uh, this will be kind of nice little kind of clever step is I'm going to create another data set or data in our means called estimate two where I'm going to add one one to the estimate which is going to be useful to place certain objects. So I'll show you where I'm getting at here eventually. So first of all we have a data attribute map. Uh, this is a very helpful statement to have no auto legend, so it doesn't create a legend for the different colors, which I don't really need. Um, attribute map, we've seen all this kind of before. Again, we're doing uh, these attributes. So this is for the limits. So those upper and lower limits, I want it to be colored black. But this is an important thing here. You notice here I have two statements of VBAR parm. Why is that? Well, it's because that normally you can't just color uh, these different ones by different colors if they're all in the same group, that is by species. This is a, this is a cool little, little thing we did here. So first of all, we do our first uh, V-bar category, which has our attribute ID, so it gives us these colored bars. But then we do a second one with, with our estimates upper and lower 
because if you try to put the estimates in here with this, it, it just kind of gets messed up for some reason. But if we do a second one, put the limits, but then we tell it to the fill of our actual boxes, no fill. It has clear boxes that it throws on top. Again, like a kind of like layers that gives us our nice bars, but that are nice uh, limits, but then doesn't over lap doesn't cover up the nice colors that we made from before so that's great then next we have our y-axis i'm going to do things to it change the label change the values of course then i will this is this is where we're using this this estimate too this is kind of clever if i want to show significance um so because each of these are significant from another one thing i can do here is actually create a scatter plot y equals estimate two so that's this estimate one plus one so instead of the means it's like means plus one so it's going to be above in a nice way and species and then i can actually change my marker to black size 10 but then i can turn them and actually into asterisks and then plot it right there so i thought that was a a kind of neat way to do that kind of cleanly there there's more complicated ways to add just like text directly but for this purposes this was a kind of slick way to do that okay let's upgrade our two-way again we're doing a lot here uh, attribute map we have a fill color and line color um, we're going to again set our means uh, th this is uh, another nice little trick here because if you maybe had a eagle eye in the earlier unupgraded plot. You saw that we had tension of low, medium, and high, but it was sorted alphabetically. So it had it as H high, then L low, and then M medium, which we don't really want. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a, another tension, another category of tension two, but then we're gonna have at low equals one, medium equals two, and then um, I believe high, yeah, equals three. Same thing with um, the setup where if low, tension as low as wool is A, then we'll have them A, and then otherwise they're text B. This is this will be, these will be important for our significance levels. And then we're gonna sort this by wool and tension so we get them our data in the right order. So when we plot it, it shows up how we'd like it. So that's a nice little stack hat that you can create your own variables and sort them in a way that lets your data be sorted, even if it isn't alphabetically or numerically set up already. So now we'll do our data attribute map in here. I'll show you what we're doing here. Again, we have our attributes. We have our labels and values. We've seen that before. This is this is the big part here. Now to get these, so a lot of times you have these sort of ANOVA style tests. You'll do a post hoc test and you'll get letters to show what groups are significantly different. So Bs are all the same, but they're significantly different from A. And so what I did here is on that, um, that uh, text, I made a text variable. It was either A or B, depending on the outcome. Now I can do a text here, again at estimate two, because that estimate two is estimate plus 10, so it's 10 above the mean. So this was like 45, now this is like 55. And then I can group by tension and display cluster. So above each of these different bars, it gives a very nice little letter here. And I can, of course, Customize the, the size, the shape, of whatever color. Okay, so we've got done with bar plots. I will now leave you with a nice little animation summary of what we've gone thus far, and then we'll continue.
Okay, okay, we are on to the scatter plots. Simple scatter plots will be indeed quite simple. All we'll need to do is scatter, set a Y and set an X, and boom. There you have it. If you want two way, not much harder Y, X than an optional grouping by something like sex here for these crabs. And again, boom, not too hard at all. We want to upgrade our simple scatter plot. We can do all sorts of things. Now we'll jump back to our good old friend Glimix if we want a nice set of estimates for like a uh, like a line of best fit and confidence intervals. We can again do model speed as a function of distance. So again, y equals x. Our output is going to be in this format instead, instead of ls means. So out equals whatever our predictor variable. We need a prediction, LCL, so lower confidence limit, and UCL, upper confidence limit. We'll sort this. This is important. After you run a regression style Glimix, you want to sort it by your X variable. That makes the confidence limits and the prediction line line up with your data. Otherwise, it'll be all choppy and look weird. So that is a bit of a pitfall alert. Make sure you always sort your prediction data set. So we'll use that data set now here. Again, we'll set no auto legend. I'll show you here ahead of time. This is how scatter plots with these more statistically heavy results have. You'll have a band, a scatter, and a series, and then whatever else. The band is this thing I have here, this red thing. It's like the confidence limits. You'll have an X, whatever your X variable is. Your lower and your upper is those lower and upper confidence limits. You can set transparency and set any sort of attributes. So the fill here, I'm gonna make it red. Then our scatter is actually these dots, so against Y and X, and then you can set any sort of attributes. I'm gonna make them circle filled in black. And then our series is this line. So the Y equals now not speed, but pred, because that's what the prediction values in our data set are called. Again, if you're not sure what this is gonna be called, you can always print off this data set and see what it's called. X is a distance. Change line attributes to make this a red line. And then I can do anything I want with the labels and values of our, my axes, which I have done here. So, to recap with the scatter plots, again, it is like layers, it is like a cake. Each successive line builds on top of each other like layers in a cake. Hopefully that, that helps you, reminds you of how this works. So you want your band typically on the bottom, so it goes first, then the scatter parts, then finally on top, you want your series. <clears throat> or maybe you want to switch those around depending on if you want your line or your dots to be more prominent. So that's an uh, important guiding principle of, of layering these things. All right, I know you're not had enough of scatter plots. I know you're thirsty for more, so let's look at two sample scatter plots. So we'll get to Proclimus again with our crab data set. So uh, you can actually ignore this here. We, we didn't ultimately use this, but again, our class variables and then our model, our Y variable and our X variable. And then this is our like categorical variable here, our output is crab's pred. Again, we need to sort it so it doesn't get weird. And again, I'm gonna do a, because I can, a data attribute map. We're gonna have our ID and value like always, but then marker color, line color, and band color. And this is gonna be for these values of these two different species of crab, blue and orange. Um, I'm going to make everything blue and uh, orange respectively. So this is our SG plot that attribute map, again, band. We kind of seen this before now, since we have a two way, we need to, for each of these, 
make sure we have an optional grouping by our species so that stays the same transparency and it and because we have our band color our series color and our scatter color each colored from this attribute id uh, map make sure you have that in all of the options you know we're going to do some things here we've seen before changing the attributes of the marker so they're circle filled you can see here that it's really hard to see the bands actually from this band because they're so tightly clustered there's not a lot of error but they are there change the x and y axis labels and values now here's here's an an important little bit here that we haven't seen before though for our x axis you notice here that we have zero we have this little slash and then we continue up because sometimes it's nice if your data doesn't go to zero uh, you don't want it to set it have it go all the way down to zero and up to 60 because then all your data will kind of be pushed up and you have a lot of sort of unused white space and kind of look nasty but if you want to sort of like not be duplicitous or confusing about whether your data hits zero you can do this sort of break thing and so how we do this here is in addition to doing our values like we've done before we'll also set a range so we see what we do here is we have two ranges first is zero to one so that gives us this little bit here and then 14 to 16 which gives us this bit here and you always want to go from zero to you know a little bit above zero and then a little bit below where you'll actually start your values so you have that little space here but then our values is then zero so it marks it here and then whatever our start above the break line so 15 in our circumstances and there's not that kind of break line thing here is we can have this additional style attributes and then axis break and then there's different kinds the slanted right version is what we see here and i can set it like that and boom we've got a fully customized y-axis and of course you could do this for the x-axis as well so with that i will let you take another little kahoot test at your leisure to sort of assess what you've absorbed so far like spongy spongy cake okay let's wrap this bad boy up with some other plots we're going to have a spaghetti logistic regression and bubble plot spaghetti plot is really just another name for a series plot so we'll use x and y and then whatever our group is for those different lines to get us here so not too bad to start with logistic regression this is going to take a little more work because this is regression so we're going to need lines we're going to use our old friend proc limix uh, this data set really is uh, all that's going on here is i want the, the log population density so i need to make a new variable here's where proc glimix really shines because it can do logistic regression just as well as linear regression uh, the modeling is a little bit different we have to set up our y variable which is in logistic regression binary so zero and one we want to specifically set which event we're modeling so we're doing event equals one in parentheses and then log population density and then the big part is here otherwise it won't do logistic is distribution binary so we need to do that and then we'll have an output data set now this is also very important is since we're doing non -lin uh not non-normal distribution we do actually do this thing called iLink I'm not going to get into the details but essentially for our pred LCL and UCL we need to say we want the iLink so it gets back to the data cell so it actually plots nicely otherwise it's hand waving have waving that won't plot us things that we can interpret with our eyes all right we need to sort again by our x variable we will get our sg plot so we'll have a scatter here to get these values and then our series and then here because our pred data set called our prediction variables pred mu just don't again hand waving that's what it calls it and then x log population density density we get this nice logistic regression style line 
Okay, let's get back to a simpler time of the bubble plot. All we need to do is bubble, our x, our y, and then our size is that third variable, and it'll give us this quite nicely. If you wanna beef up that spaghetti, really add some meat to it, you can certainly do so. First of all, I'm going to create a new variable called group two so I can have the right labels I want before and after because it turns out one and two are uh, before and after a drug trial I believe or a sleep step yeah drug and then I can do a variety of things I'll show you what I'm doing here first of all you could add a title these by default don't have a title and usually you don't want a title but if you want a title you can add one then if you want a reference line so that's just a line wherever you want so I want that at the zero axis and I can do all sorts of things to it. I'll make it thicker, I'll make it black, I'll make it a short dash to distinguish it from the other lines. Then my series, again, I can make these lines a little thicker, make them easier to see. Again, change my Y and X axis labels. And then here's a thing we haven't done before, our key, which is our ID here. Key legend, we can change things around. For right now, I just want to change the location. So I want to be outside of the actual graph. So right here, and then position to the right. I could have it top, left, or bottom, but I want it right. And then this across means that each line is uh, on its own uh, row. Now for logistic regression, we're going to do some more things here. First of all, let's add a band. And to do that, we need this LCL mu. So again, this is a little different from the simple linear regression, which is have this LCL. Again, you can print out this data set if you need to check what the names are, make it a bit transparent, make it gray, no sweat to it. Change stuff with our scatter plots, change their size and color with the series. Change the color to red so we have that nice red line and changing our y and x axis and here like i mentioned before you can make these sort of line breaks in the x axis as well and that's what we do here using this ranges values and then again with our style attributes have an axis break that we want formatted like that now, if my talk about spaghetti and spaghetti plots and meat and cake didn't make you hungry, hopefully, hopefully this will. You know, give you. You can tell that I, I create some of these slides around lunchtime. If this doesn't help, maybe maybe this or or this, maybe this. Okay, I'll I'll stop mocking you and let's get on to our final bubble plot. A little bit less edible. So with bubble plots. I'm not going to do anything too crazy, except for one little text thing here. First of all, I'll make my bubbles transparent. Now here's a cool thing here is you can do, this is one way to add text, inset. So then your text, so bubble size represents horsepower to tell you what, why the, the bubbles are different sizes. And then you can position them so I can do this on the bottom right. And then our attributes, I'm going to make it size 11. Then our Y and X axis. One little thing I'm going to do for each is create these grids. So it kind of helps us orient with the values a little easier. And then change values and label attributes as we've seen before. Okay, I will let you scamper off again with some more exploration. Uh, so, for these bubble plots, some of these other plots, I haven't done any data attribute maps, I mean, but you certainly could, so why don't you try doing that? Try creating a couple different attribute maps and try it out on this bubble plot. And there again are prompts in the SAS code. All right, we've made it nearly to the end. We've got through our plots. I would implore you to help us out here and try out the post-test 
and survey if you haven't already done that and as promised i have that neat special treat in the example sas code i have contained basic introductions to what's called macros that allows you to generate statistics and pre-built graphs so like in r i give you functions macros are sort of like functions in sas so i have this mean plot sorry mean test and plot test and they can create means and then also plots for example these create some pretty quick plots from some data sets you can find the example of the macro code in sas again so how's that for a nice little treat all right i will give you another summary with a cute little animation and then our closing references and acknowledgements And here's a lot of references. Hopefully these help you out. And as always, I'm part of the Dakota Cancer Collaborative on Translational Activity, supported by NIH. Please cite us if my work here has helped you and your research slash teaching. Thank you.